Okay. So welcome to part two of my series on persuasion. This is one part of my series on critical thinking. The point here is that critical thinking requires that you be aware of how people are trying to persuade you and how to think more carefully about persuasion itself. The last session, I looked at the question of how language functions, because persuasion is primarily an aspect of language. Now, there are other aspects of social context and uh, emotion that are involved, but language is at the heart of persuasion. That is, we're looking at the way symbols work uh, in, in to change people, to affect them. So this session, I'm going to be looking at, though, the relationship between persuasion and in its context of all language use. That is, I want to get a sense of how do we use language to solve our problems, and then where's lang a, a persuasion in relationship to that. So this will be maybe 20 minutes. We'll see where it goes, and um, it'll be open for questions afterwards. So the uses of language. I'm moving here in a complex direction that is there's some traditional material in fact there's lots of traditional material on the uses of language but as i've noted i'm trying to organize all of my thinking in the context of michelle meyer the belgian philosopher's thinking so that the uses of language then would all be related to problem solving or answering questions that is we only use language because we have a problem that we're trying to solve and if I then integrate that with the traditional uses of language, I could say that there are three critical problems that all language must solve. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It, it, it could be just gabble. That is, problem number one, all language must get attention. Otherwise, nobody hears it. It's somehow, you have to grab attention. And so that leads to the initial purpose of uh, in thinking about language, which is, is to entertain or express. That is, it's got to do something that grabs attention. Next, and I'll, I'll look at these in more detail in a few moments. Next, it must create understanding. That is, language is about content, cognitive content. It has to have some at some level, uh, even in an inversion. Well, I'm not going to go into the complexities of that. Uh, or what's the point? So you have to have language's core purposes to inform. And last, you have to get action. That is one of the core problems we use language to solve is to get things done. We're trying to accomplish something and therefore the third purpose of language is to persuade. What we can think of these three is that they're a triangle. In every communicative act, in every effort to communicate, you have to address all three of these. That is, if they are not all three present, you actually don't have an act of communication. So you can think it's kind of a triangle with three sides. One side is to entertain, express, that is to get attention. Another side is to inform, that is to create understanding. And last, it must persuade, get some sort of action. Now, the triangle can have many different shapes. Something can be primarily about entertaining, or primarily about informing, or primarily about persuading. But it doesn't matter what it's primarily about. It must still carry out the other two functions, or it gets ignored. It just, just isn't part of human communication. So we have to think of this as a triangle where all three are present in every communicative act. And if you look at what I'm doing right now, uh, I have to get your attention. So I use visuals, I use expression, expressive language. I try and use find apt metaphors, uh, like a triangle, uh, things that will grab your attention. I'm not trying to entertain you, but I am trying to get attention and express the concepts in an effective way. I'm also trying to inform you to create understanding about a key component of how human beings communicate. I, I mean, that there is nothing here if it wouldn't be for the goal of informing. And then finally, I need to persuade you. Not a lot. That's not a key point in this particular exercise. That is, at a certain level, I don't care. But I should be at least persuading you to take this material seriously. Whether or not you do anything with it, that's up to you. 
but I would love you to be persuaded that this is an important part of critical thinking. So that's an aspect even of this, which is primarily about informing you and doing it in such a way that keeps your attention, at least for the length of the presentation. But it doesn't matter where you go, what you look at, uh, where communication is happening, all three of these are present. So I could say more, but I, I think I'll move on and look at these three in a little bit more detail. So let's look at what I mean by entertain or express. That is, what we're doing with all language is trying to stir emotion and imagination. So we could be reading poetry, reciting a script, acting, acting in a play, uh, writing fiction, whatever we're putting into words, uh, we're, we're trying to stir emotion, get you a sense of involvement, um, get your sense of imagination going. What could be going on here? What could this mean? Uh, it can go in many ways. I mean, much we could have things that are primarily about entertaining. That is, you can even have poetry that is just about the delight in the flow of the words. You don't even, and the imagination they create. It doesn't really care to persuade you. It's not even necessarily informing you. And those will be there a little bit, but, but it's just the delight in the words themselves. Uh, you've got that. Or the words, or you know, I've used a smiley face symbol, an emoticon. That is, they're about grabbing your attention, your emotions, so you're immersed in it. You're attracted to it. You, you get a sense of there's something meaningful here for me. Meaningful in what sense? Well, just I'm engaged. That's meaningful. Uh, not very meaningful. Uh, I'm, after this may be over, I may be gone. That is, I can go to a comedy club and can forget completely anything about what the comic said when I'm done. I just know that I enjoyed the time. Well, that's good enough. That's a fine communicative act. Yes, it at least had to persuade you that it was fun and it had to be built around some kind of cognitive understanding. Humor does require that, but it was mostly about the pure emotion, the joy of being present there and, and, and getting caught up in what the comic was saying. So this is a very powerful use that, that goes on all around us. A good teacher knows they have to catch the imagination of their students. They have to entertain them a little bit, not too much. You don't want them caught in the entertainment, but enough that they think it's a good experience learning because in fact, it's work to learn. Uh, and, and you want students to enjoy the work, feel that the work is even a little bit fun. Um, Otherwise, they simply curse their instructors, and that gets a little bit wearing as an instructor. So you have them ideally are attracted to learning, to learning the stuff. Your enthusiasm, your commitment shows, and they pick it up. So there's always, even in a highly inf informative response, you, know, you really want to create that sense of emotional engagement. So we're looking for that in every community of act. And so I, I strongly recommend that all of you look at the world around you and just look at how every commutative act is trying to grab your attention, to gain a sense of emotion and imagination from you. Uh, could be a billboard, it could be a conversation with a friend, but regardless, it's got to have some of those hooks in order to keep you. I mean, quite frankly, in its worst case, if it doesn't keep you, just fall asleep. Well, oh, or maybe you do if you're older. Um, if you're younger, you just start yawning. Um, I fall asleep. But it's got to have some level of that in order to take your attention and, and to keep you engaged, regardless of what else is going on. So entertain or express, one of the core functions of language. And then there's to inform. Uh, all language needs some kind of communication of understanding. That is, and, and the easiest way of looking at that is to look at people who speak a foreign language in your presence. It's like, there's no information content. You can't figure it out. You might get a sense of the emotions that are involved from tone and body language, but the cognitive content, the understanding content isn't there. You haven't got it. So it isn't communication, not in any important sense to you. 
uh, unless you can kind of pick up from the emotional sense what they might be talking about. And actually the human brain is pretty good at doing that. But without that, it is not communication. So what you really want is information, a certain measure of information that goes with the, um, the, the kind of creates the body of the information, the communicative act. This, you want something. So you, you end up looking at this. It's easy to see where this is the primary focus of communication. So, you know, if you get the transmission of data, um, digital information, it's being transmitted all the time and it is communicative act. It is pure information. You can actually even read it if it's purely digital. But if you get that turned into a technical manual or a handbook of some sort uh, that's just engineering drawings, things like that, again, now we're working at just pure information, but it's still got to have a, a way to get your attention. Um, teaching, which is what I do, a lot of that has to do with that information content, how to package it, get it across, because I'm trying to inform my students. I'm trying to create that sense of knowledge. Uh, it's often when you find communication in a standardized form, that is almost a perfect sign that there is an important aspect of informing. So anything that kind of stands still as written text is clearly oriented in some critical ways around informing you. The ideal here is the grounds for common understanding. That is that the information isn't just information, but that it gives you the ability then to do things, which is where we'll be going in a moment. That is what you're looking for is to understand the world better. All text is about, well, not all text, but, um, quite frankly, but most texts, in particular the texts I deal with most of the time, are about creating understanding. So you end up with a standardized model that allows you to see what's going on and gain a sense of what's happening in the world. So um, which brings me to the last point here, that understanding requires that the information be reality oriented. That is, you need some sense that what you're looking at connects to the world as it really is. And I don't want to get into the philosophy of what really is, but at the very least, you need a sense in the information that it means something to you. So if you look at engineering diagrams, if you're an engineer, it's really meaningful, tells you all about reality. And if you're not an engineer, it really doesn't make much sense, and it could be even attractive. Uh, I know an engineer who designs um, circuit diagrams to look like art images. I have, in fact, in my files somewhere, I have a copy of one of his circuit boards that is done in the traditional style of uh, First Nations uh, orcas. It's fascinating. It's an absolutely stunning piece of circuit board. Uh, so it isn't just an engineering piece in its technical sense. It's set up for electronic components and how to solder them into place to create a particular um, tool of some sort. It has actually got a, an entertaining component. But otherwise, it's nonsense. Without that image that kind of entertains or expresses, it's just nonsense unless you're an engineer. And if you're an engineer, you might say, well, it could be a lot more efficient if you'd get rid of the art. And that is, there's more technical detail that, that could be uh, in, in built into that circuit board. It doesn't have to communicate art. It can, in fact, just be a purely technical document and might be more effective in some senses in those terms. That is, it's got a tie to reality as you experience it, whatever that means. And philosophy of reality is really interesting stuff, but um, we're not going to go there, except you might want to read uh, Meyer and look at the issue of problems and how problems are in fact the basis of our understanding of reality. But I'm going to leave it at that. Now, last, persuasion. The most, one of the critical pieces, I wouldn't say the most important, but I think often it is the most important uh, aspect of language is persuasion. That is, you want to persuade people get action from an audience. This is a core problem. Why are you trying to communicate? You want a friend to take you seriously. You want your students to learn something. You want your employees to get the job done. You're trying to get action, and that's what your words are about. So 
I, I, I would say this is the most common purpose of language. That is, all the purposes are most common in a certain sense. But what drives us to put things into words, the problem that drives us is typically to get something done. That is, if we're only acting to entertain, eh, to inform, well, it's important. But what we really want almost all the time is to get some kind of action. So even a comic who is just dancing with words and creating laughter and humor is still trying to persuade you that they're a good comic and you should pay for the, feel good about paying for uh, the um, uh, event that you're attending. So th even there, there's a certain aspect of persuasion. What we're talking about there though, is then the power through words. How words can accomplish a transformation, a change in the audience. That's important. This is where the critical thinking really becomes important. When somebody is trying to persuade us, and people are always trying to persuade us, they're trying to transform us into something different using words. So it's really important that we pay attention to the process, what's going on, how is it functioning? It is we need to know how we are being transformed if we're going to be good critical thinkers. And at the same time, if we're going to be engaging in language, it's really helpful to know for ourselves how we are trying to persuade others, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve, and get very clear about that. That is the ethics of language, we'll look at that next week, the ethics of persuasion, is about being honest about what you're trying to accomplish, and then how do you do that? <clears throat> But I'll note here that persuasion has a negative connotation. That is, our emotional senses, we don't like it. That is, we're dealing with something that is vital to all communication, and yet we have a certain sense it shouldn't be there. Nobody should be trying to persuade us. That is, I as a teacher should only be informing you. I shouldn't be trying to persuade you that it's important. Because shouldn't the information carry itself? And if we look at entertainment, shouldn't we just be entertained? Why should we need to be persuaded that it is a valuable way of spending our money to be entertained? We have this connotation of persuasion. And if our boss is trying to persuade us to work harder, well, of course, that's a bad thing. Because we're working as hard as we can sort of maybe you know we're, we're, we're putting ourselves out so so don't try to persuade us to work harder it, it just doesn't feel right and yet we all have to do it that is how do human beings create groups create teams create dynamics create a context where we're engaging in something it's because there's a certain component of persuasion that's going on so it's everywhere. Yes, we feel negatively about being persuaded. We shouldn't need to be. We should be able to just think our way through. But in fact, we have to be persuaded because we don't necessarily agree. And that brings us to the critical point, and this is a Meyer point, that is what persuasion is about is to answer the question, how are we to live together? That is, we have to figure out how we're going to work at things together, how we're going to be a collective, how we're going to be a herd, how we're going to be a team, how we're going to be a group, how we're going to be a family, how we're going to be a company, how we're just going to feel good about each other. That is, we have to be persuaded to live together. I mean, human beings, we're uncomfortable. We have our own drives, our own needs, our own ways of doing things. And to, in fact, create the group, to give us a herd sense, to create the team. We have to be persuaded about the value of giving up a little bit of ourselves so that we can get along with others, so that we can live together. So you can see where the negative connotation comes from. We do have to give up some of ourselves to effectively work together. And persuasion is about getting us to that place. On the other hand, we have to do it. I mean, human beings as solitary creatures are not very effective at much of anything. It's our communicative abilities that give humanity the power to be who we are, that is, to be people. We don't do much on our own. 
We use communication as central to what we construct, the lives we live, the work we do. And that means persuading others, giving up a little of ourselves in return for gaining the value of all of what we can do together. So it's this collective that we create simply on the basis of our ability to communicate. But that requires persuasion. We have to be persuaded that this is important. We have to be persuaded to give up something of ourselves. Yeah, we don't want to do that. In order to gain what is being offered, in order to engage in what's important, in order to become part of, of what is going on around us. How are we to live together? Persuasion is about answering that question, getting us into that place where we live together effectively not giving up too much, and certainly persuaded that we're going to be gaining enough that makes it worthwhile and ideally gaining more. If you want to think about it that way, yes, persuasion is a transaction. We are being persuaded to do something we might not otherwise do, to give up something we may not want to give up. But persuasion is about convincing us that we're actually going to get more out of that. So that my goal when I'm teaching is to transform my students so that they, yeah, they're giving up their time. They could be out with friends. They could be doing anything. They could be with their families. Lots that they could be doing that might be more satisfying, more enjoyable. And I have to persuade them that it's important to sit there and listen. Because I think it is important. That is, they will get more out of it in the long term. So how do I do that? I have to persuade, I have to use persuasive language, evocative images, things that grab their attention and then convince them that this is a worthwhile activity. Otherwise, they simply go, well, I got to get through this course because I want my degree. That's the transaction that's important. Or they go, this is so terrible. I don't even want to be part of the degree. I've got a life to live. This is, I'm not gaining enough. That is, I have to persuade students that they are gaining enough that's worthwhile at least sitting in my course and ideally maintaining the degree to the end because I think there's real value in it for them. But I have to persuade them. Or maybe they're persuaded already by somebody else or something else. That's possible. But persuasion is there giving us the answer to that question, how do we live together? And in that context, I think the way to think about this is, in another sense, it's simply persuasion is about getting buy-in, buy-in to anything. You want people to join your team, to do the work, to come to the club, whatever. You want to get buy-in, which means you're looking at persuasion as a tool for motivation, convincing, unifying. I mean, is that negative? Um, well, it could be. But mostly unifying, we like that. That's a positive thing. But it doesn't happen without persuasion. Change. Many of us need to make changes. We see life as change. Well, how do we do that effectively? Well, we need to be persuasion. Inculcate. That is, we want to impute stuff, get stuff going inside of people. And again, it takes persuasion. We want to transform them. I mean, think of the way we work with children or students and as teachers or parents, you're trying to transform people into something that you think is better, to realize their potential, to become somebody they could be. That's the essence of it, transformation. That's persuasion. And then, of course, there's selling. Persuasion and selling. In fact, the two are often seen as synonymous. I, okay, like getting buy-in, but... Selling means is a harder push, but marketing, selling is vital to our commercial culture. You cannot live in a capitalist society without understanding the importance of selling and therefore of persuasion. How do you sell somebody so that they will put out their hard earned money to buy something or their corporate cash to invest in something? How do you get that happening? It's persuasion. Don't like it but it is an essential skill set. So as uh, Bhavya pointed out earlier, there are whole books written on selling, on persuasion, because we have to do it effectively if we're going to prosper in a capitalist world. But even outside of a capitalist world, it's still, you need to motivate, convince, unify, all these things that persuasion accomplishes. So you want to look at the world, you want to say, how am I being persuaded? 
Who do I want to persuade? What would persuasion accomplish? Because remember, this goes back to the question of how are we going to live together? How are we going to accomplish things? That's where persuasion takes us. Accomplishing, achieving, transforming the world, feeling better about ourselves. It is, we're going to do that through being persuaded and therefore creating the communities, the lives, the families, the teams that make our world worthwhile, effective, ongoing, you know, full of meaning and purpose. So it's vitally important that we're aware of persuasion, how it functions, how we're using it. And then remember the other side of it, how it's being used on us, how other people are working to transform us, to change us, to sell to us. Once we understand persuasion more effectively, and I strongly encourage people to go out and read, study, and keep looking at this in depth. This is merely an introduction to why it's important. But keep looking at this because persuasion is everywhere. You need to be aware of it. It can be very subtle. Next week, we'll look at some of the issues of the techniques, how it works, the way people persuade you honestly, thoughtfully, or slanting things, being devious, um, sliding things in in ways that get past your critical filters. Persuasion is important. Persuasion is everywhere. And you need to understand it in order to function effectively. So I'm going to wrap this up there and say thank you for uh, listening. I'm really interested in seeing where you go in your world with understanding persuasion, vital aspect of critical thinking being aware of how you are persuading others, how others are persuading you. How do you get buy-in to create the communities around you? So I'll leave it there. Next week, we'll be looking at persuasion in more depth at the techniques themselves, and then the ethics of persuasion. So thank you. And if I can stop the recording.